National Preservation Month. And welcome to our virtual gathering presented by the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance, the statewide membership-based historic preservation organization. My name is Beverly Thomas, and on behalf of the Preservation Alliance, I am pleased to be welcoming you to Old Barn History and Preservation with John Porter and Aaron Sturgis. We are now in our third month of Old House and Barn Expo on the road, our COVID safe replacement of our postponed 2020 Expo. We'll be offering these virtual sessions throughout the year and hope to include some in-person person events in the fall as well. We love getting you and other old house and barn owners and enthusiasts together to share practical information from highly qualified presenters, making connections and offering you a dose of energy and inspiration too. A few housekeeping points I'd like to mention before we get started. I'd like to remind you we are recording this session and ask you to please stay muted to keep the background noise to a minimum. You may also want to spotlight the speakers during the presentation by choosing the side-by-side -side speaker option under the view feature. And also we'd like to ask you to turn your video off during the presentation to help the PowerPoint run a bit more smoothly. Today's presentation will run about 45 minutes and will be followed by a 15 minute q and I'll wrap up the program by 7 p.m but John and Aaron have agreed to stay on for an additional 15 minutes for those of you who would like to continue the discussion. Because of our high numbers today, we encourage you to use the chat function for questions and we'll do our best to address your questions during the Q&A period. And before we close, we'll select the lucky winner of our Expo door prize. And now I'm pleased to introduce our speakers. John Porter grew up in old barns on his family's dairy farm in Lebanon, New Hampshire, and went on to a career with New Hampshire Cooperative Extension, advising farmers in dairy management and facility design. He has applied his background to become an authority on preservation of historic barns. This illustrated presentation is based on Porter's book, Preserving Old Barns, Preventing the Loss of a Valuable Resource, now in its second edition. John also lectures on the topic through the Humanities to Go program throughout the state. Aaron Sturgis collaborated with John on preserving old barns, contributing his expertise on the chapters on joinery, structural timber framing, and preservation. Aaron began working in historic preservation in 1987 and established his own company in 1992. Preservation Timber Framing, a traditional timber framing company specializing in the structural repair of historic timber frame buildings, was incorporated in 1998 with a team of just three craftsmen. Today, PTF's expanded crew includes highly skilled craftspeople dedicated to the pres preservation of historic buildings. We are so pleased to have them both with us today. So at this time, I'll turn it over to John. Okay. Thank you, Beverly. Yeah, we're going to talk about old barn history and preservation. It's a real treat to have Aaron on board. So I'm going to do a brief history and then turn it over to Aaron to cover some things on preservation. Uh, the reason we get into this is a lot of our old barns are in bad condition, like this one on the left. Uh, they're originally used for dairying and agriculture, and when that wasn't taking place, people didn't keep up with them, because barns have been a long time part of our tradition. In fact, I sign all my books with Proverbs 3, 9 to 10a. It says, honor the Lord of thy substance, and the increase of thy first fruits so shall thy barns be filled with plenty. Uh, on the right, though, you see a barn that somebody did take the financial investment to fix up. And even though it looks very new, uh, give that four or five years and that will beautifully age into old boards. Uh, we kind of start our history lesson talking about English barns. And this is a special one in Penacook. Uh, we think this was built as a double English, which is extra large for an English barn because this barn on the left is a more typical English, more of a petite barn, a sustainable agriculture type things, just a few cows and pigs and so forth, a low pitch roof, uh, the doors under the eaves, and a floor print that really comes from, from Europe with uh, the cows usually on that left bay and then the center drive through, then the right bay would be hay or grain storage and so forth protected on the north side from the wind and so forth. Uh, on the right, you see an English barn being expanded. Uh, these were little barns and as agriculture grew, it was very common to put an addition. Uh, this is an English barn up in my neighborhood where I grew up in Lebanon. Uh, this is a very large English and we're pretty sure it was added onto on the road end 
and maybe even a lean-to onto the front. And then they started connecting these. And these barns were so rugged, they literally could be moved like a box. And uh, here, this is one that was moved across the meadow. And uh, on the one on the left, you see an uneven roof line a little bit, but they were kept about 10 feet apart when they were brought together. And that space was closed in as a very common practice for linking these barns. Or sometimes they took them down and reassembled them. Now on the right, you see the, uh, they got a new owner and he's been trying to uh, preserve this barn and fix it up. And unfortunately, the south end literally collapsed as he was fixing it, but he is restoring it to the original single English. Well, time moved on and uh, on the left here, we have a real early example of a Yankee barn. And we call this kind of Yankee ingenuity and in that our settlers before us were saying, why are we building these barns with the doors under the eaves and dealing with snow, a low pitch roof, it doesn't shed the snow and so forth. So they started building the, uh, you know, this Yankee style. And so this one with the Chet Riley owned in Hamptons, a very early version, probably late 1800s. Most of them were built in the 1850s on. In fact, the 1850s had to be the heyday of New Hampshire agriculture because a lot of these barns were built and you see a lot more practical. You got the steep pitch roof, you got the door in the end, and they're actually very easy to add on to because you can just keep adding bays and the stable continues. Where with the, the English barn you added on and the stable got disconnected by quite a few feet and they're almost like two separate barns. Well, even these barns got added on to as time changed and agriculture grew. Very common to see a lean to addition on the back of a Yankee. And this barn on the right has a silo on the end, which may have been a little short-sighted and it made it a little more difficult to add on to. And maybe just guess, maybe that's why that farm closed quite a number of years ago. Because it was common even to add a, a one-story addition onto these older barns because agriculture kept growing. Uh, this is kind of a nice story here. This is the Jones farm in Chichester. And they are in fact using a Yankee barn for its original intent. They made a decision in 2001 to renovate this barn. Uh, there's four rows of cattle in here and two gutter cleaners and a round barn pipeline. And they wanted to maintain that family structure. Okay, we're up into the 1860s or so. And um, there was concern about being competitive with the West. The railroad was bringing a lot of goods to the East and so forth. And so even the departments of agriculture were promoting ways to make barns more efficient, build them more efficient. Uh, this one on the left is a shaker barn up in Enfield, and it has the high drive. So you go up on the second floor and pitch the hay down to make use of gravity. The one on the right is kind of the reverse. This is an open basement with a side hill barn, and the manure can be pitched down and taken out in the spring, but always to try to make things uh, easier to do. And speaking about using gravity, here's a huge barn up in Franconia. Uh, you drive in up, the, the roof kind of hits almost at the driveway. You drive in at that high level and you pitch the hay down two levels and the stable is in the basement. And up in these barns, you had the scaffold. And this actually changed over time, how that was used. In the beginning, it was sort of the extra hay at the end of the season, kind of the spare for the spring. And then when the hay fork was developed, they ended up dropping the hay on the scaffold from the fork and pitching it down, once again, making use of gravity and being more labor efficient. So this hay fork on the left, uh, this could pick up five or 600 pounds of hay. It would lift it up, a horse to be outdoors and haul a rope and the crew inside would holler when to trip the rope and, and dump the hay. And there are a few there who set up with electric motors. And this company advertised you could eliminate a horse and have an electric motor to operate your hay fork. And then things progressed and we started doing more to these barns. Uh, we kind of laugh about this barn on the left with all those cracks, but you know, that was actually pretty even ventilation. We started adding clapboards often on the front side and maybe see to shake shingles on the sides. We started bringing water in, letting the cows drink with water cups, and all these things are tightening things up, creating moisture, and ventilation became an issue. So that's when the cupola came around. These aren't just decoration. Uh, they first of all helped ventilate the 
them out because hay does give off a little moisture even after it's cured and put away. But also it's very common, like on the right, to see these channels that would go from the hay stable, from the stable up through the hay mow and up through the cupola. And that cupola would actually share space with venting air from the hay mow, as well as these vents going up and bringing up stale air out of the stable down below. Well, another thing that happened in the late 1800s, and this is kind of a New England thing, but it's the attached buildings. And I used to give this lecture and say that that was for uh, allowing the farmer to go from the house to the barn without getting cold in the winter. But Tom Hubka, who wrote uh, Big House, Little House, Back House, Barn, has another argument. And he's saying it was really part of that thing of being competitive. And these were actually little industries that were built along the way. And it's often true. You'll find a, a barrel shop or a blacksmith shop or so forth. And so that it's more likely that was done uh, to be to create some other income for the farm. And something else we write about in the book is the village barn. This is the even your professional folks had a driving horse and a milking cow and maybe some chickens. And some of your Victorian homes with a one car garage, probably that originally was a, a village barn. And then New Hampshire had a logging industry up north. These are kind of just big homely barns. You don't hear much about them. Uh, the one on the right, they said held like 96 horses and 200 ton of hay. Uh, there's a, that's fallen down now, but there's a big one in Berlin that I hear that may get restored. And then we had a chicken industry with poultry. In the 1940s, it was the heyday of the poultry industry. A lot of these Yankee barns, they added uh, windows on the south side to promote more egg production. And then you had that traditional hen house design out back. These are kind of light duty buildings. A lot of these have fallen down, but uh, indicative of a very prosperous industry in its time. Something I found very interesting, interesting as I was doing the book was these estate barns. And it was very common for some of these Boston businessmen to build a, a beautiful barn in the country, visit on the weekend. They had the best horses, the best cattle, the best sheep. And this was a pavilion stock farm owned from the Pavilion Department Store in Boston. This is the Bancroft Estate in Wakefield. And this is Corbin Park uh, Barn. This is like Corbin Park has an animal preserve and it was thought this was probably for hay storage. It has had leaded windows and actually had a beautiful cupola at one time. Okay, we're up to around 1900 now for following the history. And uh, USDA, some of those places were promoting round barns. They said, well, this would be efficient for hay in the middle, cows on the outside and so forth. But these didn't turn out to be that practical. They were difficult to build. And there was a lot of walking around the circle and so forth. And uh, we only have one of these left in New Hampshire and Piermont. Uh, it's been beautifully preserved. Okay, we're up to the 1940s or so. Now there was concern about public health and the quality of milk and milk you know, food safety and so forth. And the government came out with a rule that cows had to be milked on a cleanable and pervious surface. And the only thing that met that definition was concrete. And guess what? All these old barns have wooden floors and a lot of the stables are on the second floor. So the new barn design was concrete floor and a lot of the people moved their stables from upstairs to downstairs in these old barns and the new floor print, this is out of my files, an original old floor print of a double row cow barn. The cows either stood head to head or tail to tail. And this is a lot different than before because before you had a mixture of a hay mow and threshing floor and so forth on the first floor. Now all the cattle on the first floor, a ceiling and hay storage above. Well, now we're into the sixties or so. And in 1963, the roof truss was invented and this allowed you to have a clear span building. So we were recommending to people, you know, leave that old barn with a post every 12 feet, hard to move around and so forth and build a new barn with a truss roof, more openness, uh, easy to ventilate. And so you'll see a lot of cases in New Hampshire where there's a nice new barn out in the pasture and the old barn is just off to the side. Okay, in 1960s and 70s, another thing happened. We started promoting free stall housing for dairy cattle. Once again, change barn design forever. Now the cows were free to roam, free to choose their stall. Uh, this is a great picture and it 
Augusta Barnes, where you've got the 1840s barn up in the corner, the 1950s in the center, and then in the foreground, the 1990s freestyle. And this was a really up-to-date picture. There's now about a year 2000 milking parlor. So this changed barn architecture. Then in the 21st century, you know, margins are tight in farming and so forth. And we started to get into some uh, fabric structures. So these are called hoop barns. And so quite a difference from the pastoral settings that we would look for the red barn out in the countryside. Now we're up to the current time and now we're building these huge barns to accommodate robotic milking. Uh, these older barns were typically 36 to 38 feet wide. This barn is 170 feet wide. Now it's got several trusses, so it isn't completely clear span, but the posts are in strategic spots. So there's all openings for the cattle. This is what it looks like inside. You can see very open with the posts in the cattle divisions and very little disturbance because the cows are there and will be milking themselves by robots. So on the left is the robot room, a environmentally controlled room. Uh, these units cost about 250,000 each and they will recognize the cow by her transponder. And as she comes in, it will put the machine on automatically and clean her udder and everything, senses when she's done milking and removes the unit all with no human intervention. So we're gonna be talking about preservation and, uh, and to really to justify this, we really need reuse for barns and the historic folks are very good about suggesting things and accepting some of these ideas of have a solar panels, uh, antique shop, uh, retail sales. And then I think the ideal use you know, is the farm stand that adapts to the farm and uh, people really love uh, going into these old barns, but it helps to justify the expense it takes to preserve our old barn. So now I'm going to turn it over to Aaron to talk about architectural features and preservation. So I'm going to stay ensconced in the 18th and 19th century and talk about timber frame barns. Some of you may have recognized in John's slides your own barn because there are particular styles that were built and retained over time. And we'll talk a little bit about two different styles of barn and how they were built in two case studies that illustrate uh, the preservation method. So the next one, John. There are two types of, well, two methods really of saving old barns. One is restoration, taking it back to a particular point in time. And the other is preservation, maintaining its structural integrity, but also retaining the changes that are made over time. That's what I'll be talking about. I'll be talking about historic preservation of barns. The major priorities in preservation of any kind, obviously you need a good foundation, a good roof, and go ahead, John. And you have to take care of the little things. These are things that everyone listening right now can do around their own barn. You gotta get the holes covered in the roof, no matter what. You might have to hire someone for that. That's a little dangerous, but the rest of it, removing vegetation, you know, that lilac bush, or that maple tree that found its seed there and grew right up next to the barn, you can remove that type of thing and you might even endeavor a little bit of grade change to get the water to pitch away from the barn. Those are really inexpensive things that can really save the structure um, for the long term. So those are really important to do. Barn preservation is a process. Um, you can do major repairs over time. You can do each wall a different year. There are different ways to stretch out the preservation of barns to keep it viable and sustainable and repairable over time. Go ahead, John. Some of the jobs that you're going to do is uh, in the beginning might be just to stabilize the barn. If you have a barn that you're feeling really uncomfortable about because it has some structural issues, then you can do some really basic things. You can throw cribbing at it, which I'll talk about in a minute. You can put in a cable here and there. Those are temporary stabilization efforts that will get you a little further down the road if you have to save money in order to engage with the full preservation effort. They're not a primary or a long-term fix, however, and you wanna balance the, the cost with the actual benefit. Go ahead, John. In any case, whether you're stabilizing or fully restoring or preserving a barn, you want to try to use in-kind materials. In other words, you need to understand the structure that you have 
in order to determine the best path forward for its repair. I'm going to be talking about timber frame barns from the 18th and 19th century, and I'm going to show you a little bit about how we repair them so that you can get an idea of what to expect if you really want to head out and do some good preservation. We try to use local mills in every respect, and we can still get really, really top-notch, 100% beautiful, excellent timbers in New Hampshire. It's a wonderful place to live. So go ahead, John. I'm gonna do two case studies, but let me begin with a minor introduction into two types of barns that are built. I'll be talking first about the English barn. In John's early photographs, you saw the early Eve entry barn that was made in the English tradition. That is a scribe rule barn, which I'll show you aspects of in this case study. Um, and there's, and they are created in with mortise and tenon joinery, and they are created in bents and bays. If you think of a loaf of bread, that's the best way to understand bents and bays. Each slice of bread is a bent. It has two posts, a tie beam that connects the posts, a pair of rafters, and various braces that hold that bent together. In between the bread slices is the bay and they'll have connected girts and so forth. That is very true of the two types of barns I'm going to show you and I'll, and I'll mention that in the slides. Go ahead, John. This is a barn in New Hampshire that was in disrepair. You can see there's almost no foundation. In fact, the driveway is higher than the sill. So you can imagine that it was in pretty rough shape. Here you can see the, the uh, undulations in the roof and you can see a little bit of damage on that left side. Go ahead. You can see that the uh, grade is very high around this. Remember I mentioned changing the grade can really give you some time. Um, this one was well overdue. You can also see the paint screaming off this, off this uh, building, which means there's moisture getting in. Go ahead. And there is moisture getting in this barn. I mean, this is dry rot. It's classic. If you have an old barn, you may find different levels of this. Um, this is a fungal growth, and that's because water got in and soaked into the wood. Go ahead. The inside of this barn was pretty much unused because it was so damaged and so obsolete that they didn't use it very much. So that adds to the neglect that you see on some of these barns and, um, and the fear of using that barn because it was in disarray. Go ahead. This is a scribe rule frame, and I can tell that by the marriage mark. Some of you, as you look into your own barns, will find these marks all around the different aspects of the barn. In a scribe rule frame, the original joiner would have put one piece on top of the other on a level surface and literally scribed the joinery that you see in this picture. And then he would have marked that joinery spot with a, what is called a marriage mark. In other words, this piece is married to the piece below it. That is how the earliest of the English frames were built in New England. Um, and it's a wonderful method of joinery, but it is time consuming and requires a high level of skill, all of which is worth doing, but it took a, quite a while to build a barn like this. So if you have these marks anywhere in your barn, then you've got quite an early barn and it's done in the scribe rule method of joinery. Go ahead. In this case, we had so much damage down low that we decided to pick the barn up and move it off its current foundation and repair it by putting new foundation in and new sills and so forth. So you see extensive rot here. We sometimes will use a building mover to lift these buildings up. Other times we'll fix them right in place. Go ahead. In this case, we moved the barn off its current uh, location, put in a whole new foundation. There was actually very little foundation under this barn, which is very typical of 18th century buildings. They are typically, you know, if they have any foundation at all, it's a rubble stone foundation and they can move with the frost and freeze in the thaw cycle. So in this case, we've poured a new concrete foundation. We've also elevated the, the first floor walls to elevate this barn because it's going to be used for a new purpose and it has machinery coming in and so forth. So we needed to get a little bit of height out of it. Go ahead. New sills going down, very simple uh, sills for this barn, but also note that we are being code compliant with tension connections. That's the metal piece in the center of the photo. 
That is a compliance uh, piece for holding the barn down in heavy winds. Go ahead. In situ repair, we've moved the barn back onto its new foundation and now we're repairing the timber frame. In this case, we're cutting a splice in a rotten post bottom. And you can see that we've lifted a little bit with the jack and the cribbing um, to facilitate that repair. Go ahead. There's the repair on the bench and that's called a bladed scarf joint. And it's a very simple, very traditional joint repair and uh, it works wonderfully horizontally or vertically. Go ahead. There's the joint in place. It's pretty straightforward to do this. Anyone can do it with a little patience. It does take handwork um, and practice and nothing more. Um, it just takes a little bit of time and the effort's well worth it. Go ahead. That's a free tenon. That's a new tenon at the bottom of a post that was saved almost entirely. So sometimes you can get away with a very simple repair um, that really makes a big difference. That tenon at the bottom of that post is absolutely essential for the longevity of that barn frame on that, on that foundation. Without the tenon, the loads from the roof push that post right off the sill. With the tenon, they stay put. Go ahead. There's a longer fix. Every fix that we do on any barn that we find rot in is determined by the extent of that rot. And you just follow the rot and cut it out and install the new piece. And you can see there's quite a contrast in color, but in about a year's time, that repair piece looks very natural in that barn. Go ahead. Okay, here's where I'm gonna get a little bit into the scribe rule uh, type of frame in the 18th century English frame. Here we see in the, in the left uh, corner is the post and that's a flared post. So it flares out around the plate, picks up the tie beam, which has what we are calling a bladed and keyed scarf joint. That's a major tension connection across the building. So you need to do really substantial work there. But the English barn would have the flared post the dropped plate, which is the far left portion of this photo, the tie beam, which crosses across the photo, and then the principal rafter coming down into the tie. That is called the English tying joint. That will be in any early building in New Hampshire over and over and over and over again. It was a time tested 500 year old system of joinery before it got to New Hampshire. And it's still my favorite. Go ahead. When you are doing preservation, you have to consider the client's new use. In this case, we elevated the foundation. We elevated the building by, by raising the walls of the foundation and the original staircase we wanted to retain, but we had to catch up to that staircase because it used to be at ground level. And they do a little political stumping. So we made them a little political stump and they can have guests there and they can, and they can expound upon their political aspirations on those stairs. And that's what they intend to do which I commended them for. Um, it is an adaptive reuse. They are bringing skid steers into this building. They are bringing you know, produce and everything in here. So it needed to be working for the current owner and now it does, go ahead. We retain the form and function of the original building. This is the second floor as you go up the stairs. It still retains everything that was there when it was first built. And it's just a fantastic, wonderful space, go ahead. This is the outside when it's done. Go ahead. New doors, new windows, traditional window frames. You just buy the sash. You don't need to buy a whole new window set. You can buy sash really inexpensively and just make your own frames. And this is ready to go. Go ahead. Okay, the second barn I'm gonna talk about is a different style of timber framing. And some of you will recognize this style of barn and some of you will recognize this type of joinery in your own barn if, if you look closely. This is the Palillo Barn in Chichester, New Hampshire. It is a square rule. Go ahead, John. I worked on this barn 25 years ago um, and we restored the barn at that time. It was, in, it was heavily damaged as you can see from these photos. But two years ago, the barn burned to the ground because of a hot lawnmower. So we had to rebuild it, go ahead. So last year we rebuilt this barn. So this photo here shows the original barn form and the square rule layout system that we recreated this barn with. So in the lower right corner of this photograph, of this drawing, 
you'll see a vertical post and you'll see all the little indentations. That is a, called a lead in, which is creating a square man-made form out of a non-man-made or, or a non-uniform post. So each lead in allows the timber frame joinery to come to a certain depth within the post. And that is what is called square rule timber framing. You take something that is not square or not perfectly square and you bring it to square by, by bringing everything into a certain heiress line or a chalk line that determines that depth. And you can see these lead ins if you walk into your barn and you look around and you see these lead ins it's a clear indication of the square rule method of timber joinery. In the upper right hand corner of this barn you'll see the the gable entry, unlike the eave entry at the English barn, and you'll see an interrupted tie beam. So you see three sections of tie beam across that, that form. That is indicative of a later mid 19th century barn in the square rule tradition. Go ahead. When we're doing square rule, we're doing almost everything in the shop. It's not in situ. In this case, this is a brand new barn. If you're repairing a, a square rule barn, you're doing much like you would a scribe rule barn in situ. But in this case, we're building a new barn. So the opportunity to cut everything on the bench. Go ahead, John. Uh, we have a shop where that happens. It's nice and dry and warm typically. And uh, it allows us to be extremely precise using both power tools and hand tools. Go ahead. When we are raising a square rule barn, um, we're still working with bents. Remember I talked about the bread slices and the bays in between. But when we're doing a square rule barn of this age, we are doing a bent raising instead of a wall raising. So each of the bents that you see in this photograph are beginning to be assembled on site for the first time. The big difference between scribe rule and square rule is that you don't have to pre-assemble and pre-fit everything um, in the square rule system of, of joinery, which made it more efficient, a little faster, um, and, and allowed us to do this type of of work in the, on the bench in the shop. Go ahead. Here's one of the vents uh, fully assembled and ready to be lifted into place. Timber framing um, is a great way to build. It's a wonderful strong method um, and, but it has a different system and a different sequence of construction. And when you're doing good preservation, you have to understand that that, that method is a little bit different than our modern method of, of building. Um, it's made of a series of elements that are joined um, and then assembled together and then stood up as a unit. And that's a little bit different than our, than our current way of building. Go ahead. In square rule, you can still scribe. And when we're doing re good repair work, we often will be scribing our new material into old, even if it's a square rule building. I hope that makes sense. So in this case, we have a square rule building, but I had some wane on one of the timbers. So it's my party, so I get to scribe what I want to. So that is um, just something that when you understand both methods, you have them both at your disposal and you can facilitate the best repair. When we're doing good preservation work and repairing timber frames, we really want the frame to direct the repair. We don't wanna interject our own ideas. We just wanna follow what's there and make it right again. Go ahead. This is the frame assembled. And if you look closely, you can see some of the lead ends at the braces and so forth. What's interesting about this frame and also really interesting about New Hampshire is that even though we are seeing a whole different technology in square rule framing, we are still holding on to some of the early English forms. So we have a flared post, a, a, a tie beam and a rafter that look remarkably similar to that English frame, except that it's fully square ruled and the tie beam is interrupted and now the frame has the gable entry. So we are still in New Hampshire held on to that early English technology because it worked really well but we moved on technologically in how we built them and how we purpose those spaces. So it's a really interesting evolution of technology and it is the height of technology that these barns were built. Um, and um, it's really wonderful to be able to use both technologies in the good 
preservation of any, any timber frame, regardless of age. Go ahead. This is the frame assembled. You can see the gable entry. Um, this is uh, not quite a bank barn, but it had a cellar where the pigs and so forth could be. Um, and it had a loft at each side of the drive and it had uh, tie ups for cows and it had hay storage and so forth. And you can see the Cape in the background. So it was a very early property, an early 18th century Cape and a 19th century barn. Not uncommon for farmsteads in New Hampshire or throughout New England, where we see both early and later technologies married together for a really good result. Go ahead. I think this is my last slide. And I just want to say, first of all, we're thanking the tree gods for our lumber. And as I stated before, in New Hampshire, we have great, great lumber resources. Um, I have to say that I'm so, so glad that plywood has gone up because we can do good preservation with good local timber. And so if there's anything good about how things are right now, you can still find a good local sawmill and build something out of wood. It's sustainable, it's beautiful, and good preservation is, is what that is all about. And I really appreciate um, your listening and I hope this gets you curious about your own barn. And I hope you step in and take a look um, I don't know, right afterwards. <laughs> and I think we can take questions. Yes, thank you very much, John and Aaron. Fascinating, great, great information. Um, there haven't really been any questions entered into the chat. So if you do have questions, feel, please feel free to enter them in. Um, I'll start with a couple questions that came to mind. And Aaron, you sort of answered one of them. I was gonna ask you when the English tie joint sort of went out of favor, but that's, it never really did, it sounds like. Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. I mean, the English tying joint um, is so common in the early barns because it was so time tested, um, but it's a relatively complicated joinery system. Um, and so it didn't really, but it didn't go out of favor because we were really largely settled by the English early on in this area. And then as the, as the areas along the seacoast became more crowded and other folks started moving in, you saw those ornery Englishmen move into the hinterlands of the area and they took their technology with them, but they were also reading all of the current farm journals that were coming out at the time. And they were really changing the floor plan of those structures. In other words, from that Eve entry to the Gable entry. So at that point, when you started reading the journals, you decided that you were going to be up to date and technologically advanced in your floor plan and your use of the barn, but they still held on to that early English technology. So we'll see barns in Maine and in New Hampshire from 1850 to 1860 that are created out of full length tie beams that are 40 feet long, full length plates that are, you know, 60 feet long and they'll still hold on to that English tying joint in there. Now, as you get further beyond 1860, we pretty much had cut off New Hampshire forests to the point of almost no return. I mean, they were really cut back um, during the sheep industry and everything else, you know. Um, and so then we started seeing smaller timbers used in, in timber frames and they went almost exclusively into the square rule form because they were using smaller timbers because they were less available than they were, you know, 50 years before. So by 1870, you don't see those heavy tie beams, heavy rafters anymore. Um, but up until that point, we changed their use, but not their form structurally. Um, and I and don't know, Aaron, if you explained what a tie beam is, for those who don't know, can you just explain that? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I know I shoved a whole bunch of information into a very short amount of time. Um, so if you think about a bent as a bread slice and you think about the two posts being on the outside of the bread and you think about the top of the bread being the rafters and then across the top of the bread before it rounds up, you have a tie beam that crosses across the barn and ties those two, those two posts together. That is what is tie beam. So it literally ties 
the eave walls of the barn together. So in the first barn, like what I showed you in the English um, barn, that tie beam is continuous all the way across that entire structure. In the Palillo barn, where there's an interrupted tie, that tie goes to the center drive posts. But if you look at that, if you went up, you'd saw another section of tie. So a tie beam essentially ties both E walls together, but it doesn't have to be continuous, but it has to eventually get there. Mm -hmm. So in the second barn, it's a series of beams that make up the tie that holds the barn together. And in the first barn, it is the actual tie beam itself. Okay, great. Thank you, Aaron. Yep. All right, here's a question. Fastener difference between scribe rule and square rule. The fastener difference is there, there is no difference. Um, each of the types of joinery um, have round pegs that hold the joinery together. So if you look in your barn and you have an early English barn, you're going to see the mortise and tenon joinery with a, 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 a round, generally one inch peg that creates um, the fastener between the joints. If you have a square rule building, you will see the same thing, but it might be a little bit smaller or it might be two pins instead of one. Um, there is some variation in that, but in general, it really um, is universal in timber frame joiner to see a peg of some, fo some form. And it's typically a round one inch diameter, totally dry hardwood peg. And that's typically how we hold the joinery together. Okay. Yep. Another question relating to costs of lumber. Has rough cut lumber matched the two to three time price increase of standard dimension stock? That Any is comments? an excellent, excellent question. Thank you for asking that question. It has not. Hmm. But that said, there are fewer and fewer mills that are doing good um, timber cutting. We just lost one in New Hampshire that's been around for 50, 60 years, um, partly because um, you know you just can't find someone to take over a sawmill necessarily. It's not necessarily the easiest work on the planet. Um, and you have to have a good network of loggers that supply you with timber. That we have seen change quite a, quite a bit this year. COVID has hit the logging industry pretty hard like it's hit the rest of us. So there is a supply chain issue, but the pricing has not been as exploitative, in my opinion, as, as some of the stuff we're seeing in, in the man-made materials. First of all, it's local. So that's a big advantage. We're not, we're not seeing the su supply chain interruptions that we see in plywood and pressure treated because it's coming locally from local sawmills. Um, but the, the uh, market for timber has been topsy-turvy this year throughout the state, throughout New England, there's not a huge market for just about everything right now. It's even hard to sell chips right now, um, which is a little bit odd and hard to equate directly to the COVID pandemic, but it certainly has had some relation to it. It's a little bit unknown. Um, there's some great timber organizations that, that, that follow that a lot closer than I can, than I can expound, but I do know that the uh, supply chain for timbers, for shiplap lumber, for basic repair materials has not been interrupted severely like, and the cost has not been exponential. So it does make doing that type of work a little more appealing than, 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 it, than it might be otherwise. Um, and from a perspective of whether or not they go back down or are we just seeing a delayed um, cost shift in timber and local products. Um, my sense is right now talking to the few sawyers that I work with that, you know, they're pretty ornery sawyers and they're not, they'll be damned if they let COVID knock them back too bad. So they're going to keep cutting and the logs will start coming. Um, and uh, it, and that stuff will be continued, you know, it will be available because we are a forested state now, and we, we have managed our forests much better in the last century. Um, and so that material is sustainable and available, and the pricing should, should remain pretty stable, I think. It's a great question. Great. And here's another one relating from Pete. It says, we have an old timber frame red barn with marriage marks on a rubble stone foundation we think built in the late 1700s by Dudley Gilman in Belmont. We need to replace the siding. 
Are there risks in using old materials from repurposed barns? What siding would you recommend for an old Yankee barn? Uh, well, that's a fabulous question too. Siding, depending on what you have there, uh, we talked about in-kind replacements. So it would be important to understand what you have on the barn already. Um, but typically, um, a lot of times on our repaired projects, we will use a second layer of shiplap or rough pine boards as our siding. Because typically those early English barns were what we call girded frames. They have horizontal girts and vertical sheathing. So you can strip off any of the old dilapidated rotten siding and simply add a second layer uh, over the original sheathing if it were clapboarded and so forth. If it were shingled or clapboarded, you could just go with a second layer of boards and that would be really good for the barn and relatively inexpensive and again, relatively easy to come by. If you want to put on a new clapboard, then there's a mill in Vermont that makes a Rady lease on vertical grain pine clapboard. And that is far superior to any cedar clapboard, in my opinion, not only for historic integrity, but for longevity. So there's a, a local mill in Vermont. If you look up clapboards in Vermont, it'll come up and they'll be able to supply you um, pre-primed if you wish it. Um, Eastern white cedar shingles and shakes are available in Maine and New Hampshire, and you just have to search them out. Um, and they are very good for cladding barns. John, you know that sometimes barns had one side of boards, one side of clapboards, and one side of shingles. I mean, you really don't have to worry too much unless you're really concerned with the aesthetic, but a double layer of boards will protect your barn very, very well. In New England, it was common to put clapboards on the street side and exactly. the shakes on the sides because the clapboards are a higher quality milling and it kind of showed off the front of your barn. Yep, yep. So you do see a different type of cladding uh, oftentimes on the same barn. Yep, yep. All right, and since we're talking about barn materials, let's talk about roofing materials and what you recommend. Um, John, do you want to take that one or should I? I'll start it off and you pick it up. I, All right. I think uh, the historical folks have come to really respect metal roofing. And I think when people fix up their barns, they sometimes think, oh, I've got to go back and put wood shingles or something. But I think we're all in agreement that metal roofing uh, buys a lot of preservation. And now there are a lot of colors. You can have browns and greens and things and not have that shiny look. And so I think generally, yeah, you know, the metal is pretty well accepted, but if you're putting it on an old barn that has some roofing issues, you might want to put some nailing members down first and don't rely on the integrity of the original boards that the roofing might lift. But Aaron, you pick it up from there. Yeah, I, I also really like metal roofs on barns. There are two primary types. There's one called gasket screw, which is literally a rigid, um, panel that is screwed down to the roof. And then there's standing seam, which has hidden fasteners, which is more long lasting, a little bit more, um, uh, um, uh, well, it just holds up longer because there's no, no fasteners that are seen, but it's a little bit more expensive to put on. In either case, whether it, or, or any case, you wanna strip the existing roofing off. Even if you have an old metal roof, you can't put a new metal roof over an old metal roof. Um, effectively, because you have to fasten to something. And, and John mentioned, you know, the, the laying something down to accept the metal roof. A lot of the older barns have a bit of a sweep to the rafter. And of course, a vertical metal um, sheet is not going to lay perfectly on a bent rafter. So you may have to pad out and, and, and level it out, but you absolutely want to strip off all of the original roofing materials, not necessarily the sheathing, but all of the roof coverings, any asphalt, any wood shingles, you don't want to leave that on the barn because it just holds moisture, adds weight to the structure, and really um, probably hides uh, a few sins that you should correct when you're putting a new roof on, any rot in the, in the sheathing and so forth. Um, but I am a huge advocate for metal roofing because it doesn't carry a live load. The snow will come off. Um, and it really has very little dead load, which means the weight of the material itself. When you see a lot of barns, they're under tremendous stress from three or four layers of asphalt. Uh, 
which is probably four times the weight than it was ever designed to carry. Um, so we try to always advocate for removing the asphalt shingles from those roofs. It really helps the barn tremendously. Okay, thanks. And I don't know how much experience you have with solar, Aaron or John, but do you want to comment on that? Sure. A little bit? Yeah. Um, well, personally, I do have solar on a, a newer barn that I have. You know, our barn committees talked about it. And I think pretty much even the historical folks would say that as long as it's nicely done and doesn't detract from the barn, it can be a, a source of income and maybe a reuse. But Aaron, how do you feel about it? Well, I mean, solar power is definitely, a, a, you know, part of our future. And most of the barns, especially the historic barns in New England, were well placed for solar energy in the sense that they face south, uh, typically because they were trying to utilize the sun's warmth on the side where the animals were. So they're often placed perfectly on the landscape to accept solar panels. We've had to deal with a couple of structural issues around the solar panels in the sense of making sure that the loads of the panels themselves are accepted into the barn frame and get down to the foundation. But typically these early barns are strong enough to accept a solar panel and not particularly heavy, but you do want to pay attention to the installer and make sure they understand the type of frame that you have because a lot of these early barns have principal rafters and purlins which are horizontal to the uh, roof plane. And sometimes, um, especially if there's a dip in a roof, you have to reinforce the area where there is a dip in order to accept the flat plane of the solar panel. But I think solar panels are an excellent idea for the barn. They, they might um, be a better place than the house. They are typically wide open roof spans. There's no chimneys, there's no penetrations for the plumbing and things like that that we see on the residents. So they're ideal for solar. They just have to be really made sure of that they're strong enough to accept the weight um, and the wind shear that comes with solar panels. Solar panels, because they're off the roof plane, have a tendency to accept some wind load. And you need to make sure that that's, in, that's accommodated for if you're gonna install them. So a little word of caution there, but absolute encouragement for using solar panels on barns. And we did have a solar talk and I think the solar folks actually like the standing seam because they can clip right onto it and they don't have to penetrate the roof itself. That is a really good, that is absolutely true. They make systems now that clip right onto the standing seam so they don't have to penetrate the roof unless they're bringing the wiring in someplace, which is pretty easy to accommodate. Yep, standing seam's an ideal way to have a solar panel on your roof. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Aaron. Um, we need some guidance to restore our barn. Are there grants available to help? Who can we work with for advice and to carry out the work? Well, this sounds like I should answer this question. <laughs> Agreed. The New Hampshire Preservation Alliance has a barn assessment grant program. Um, you, all that information is on our website. I will include that in the follow-up email that I send tomorrow helps, uh, well, if you're approved, the barn contractor will come out, do an assessment, walk through the barn with you and do a write-up prioritizing the needs and giving you some rough cost estimates. We also have an amazing network of barn contractors in New Hampshire, we are very fortunate. Um, and I can help you, I can send that to you as well if you're looking for barn contractors. But I have to give you a heads up that everyone is swamped right now. For this year, some of them aren't taking any new jobs until 2022, unfortunately. Yeah. But I can help you with all that kind of stuff. Um, so feel free to send me an email at any time or give me a call. That, but all that information will be in the follow-up email that I send out tomorrow. The barn assessments are a great way to get you um, to understand your barn better. Um, but what really helps the assessor is any information that you already have, the history of the place, pictures, all of that stuff can be sent ahead of time and really facilitates the process of doing a full, a full assessment of your barn. Great program. Thanks, Aaron. And um, Pete mentions in his question something about drainage work. Can you address the importance of drainage work, Aaron? Drainage, Absolutely. Proper drainage. 
Yeah, drainage is probably the cheapest money you can spend to help your barn. And what I mean is um, it's almost inevitable if you have an older barn that your drainage and your grade surrounding the barn has built up over time, um, primarily from leaves blowing up against it, you know, road beds coming in. A lot of these barns are near the road and the road has gone eight, 10 times higher than it than originally was. So a lot of times water is pitching towards the barn. And even if you think about the barn roof, there's a lot of water coming off the roof of the barn and that water has quite a bit of force. So over time, that drip line gets lower and lower and lower as it's pounded against and up to the barn. So eventually water starts um, coming off the roof, dropping down into the drip line and entering the barn foundation instead of running away from it. So it's really important to observe that at the next rain and see where the water is going. And you'll know pretty well right away where the barn needs to be um, regraded. Sometimes drainage is as simple as changing the pitch of the grade around the barn to pitch away from it. Other times, it can be a little more complicated in the sense of if you have a, have a site that is difficult to drain by gravity, then you can, um, you can bolster that, that drainage system with pipe or crushed stone and direct the water away from the barn. It's essential though, to discover where the water is currently going so that you can make the proper changes to make sure that water goes away from the barn. One issue that we often see is a driveway or a drive that is paved right up to the gable end, sometimes even covering the gable end sill to make it easy to drive in. And that can be a real problem area to repair. Um, it typically ends up with the sill rotting there. And that's a drainage issue, but it's also a man-made issue of how the, the uh, drive or the path up to the barn has been changed over time. Sometimes we wanna be a little more proactive and cut that driveway back and put drainage between the driveway and the barn and ramp across that drainage with a wooden ramp. Sometimes that's how we, we uh, make sure that the sill work that we just completed doesn't rot out in 10 years. So there's different ways to go about it, but it's really about looking at how water comes off the barn now in the next rainstorm and viewing that water and thinking like water and getting it to pitch away. Okay. Yep. Um, one more question here from Bob. Have you ever used rods and turnbuckles to pull the walls of barn back together when the tie beams separate from the outer bent beam? Why does that happen? Uh, yes, the answer, the short answer is yes. Um, but that falls into my temporary or stabilization uh, process. And here's why, Bob, the, the issue with the, uh, the walls sort of coming apart and the reason why you're tempted to put a cable on it and try and pull it together is typically not at that junction, but lower. The sills have moved, the foundation has settled. And because a timber frame is a rigid structure and works as a whole, the forces that are down low translate to the forces that are up high. So if your roof is spreading open the, the uh, plates and, at, and the posts and they're spreading open, it's more likely to do with something down low that can no longer support that post in the way that it was originally formed. So I tend to stay away from cables as a permanent solution. I look more towards what's really causing this separation. Sometimes it's the joinery has failed up high because the water has penetrated and the timber frame has rotted to an extent and that can allow a rafter to spread but most of the time it has more to do with the drainage and the foundation and the way that the basic parts of those timber frame have been supported over time. And once they are corrected, you will not need those cables. You, you just won't need them. Um, the timber frame is designed to work in both tension, which is pulling apart and compression. And they are designed time tested and work really well and they're typically not a failure of design, but more of a failure of materials if they got wet and rotted or a failure in the drainage and the foundation. That's what I find. So it, it certainly can be done as a stabilization, but I would look a little deeper 
and try to find the root cause of the issue and correct that issue. And, um, and, and that's really a better longer term repair. Okay, I was going to start my closing comments, but there's a really good question here. I would like to hear. <laughs> so we'll do one more. Where did the square rule originate and who began it? Who started it? Oh. Well, that's a whole nother talk. <laughs> uh, it's a really good question. And I, I don't think I can actually answer it because it's still one of the biggest controversies in the Timber Framers Guild that I belong to. Um, we are still searching for the earliest square rule. We are still searching for the earliest scribe rule. I mean, the latest scribe rule. Um, we know we've seen scribed uh, timber frames right up into the mid 1800s. But when did the first square rule begin? I mean, typically it became very popular at the turn of the 19th century. So we start to see it in the 1800s, um, but and it's very prominent throughout mid century and certainly how we ended timber framing in, in New England um, in favor of stick building and so forth. But it's extremely hard to tell when it first emerged. It is, however, um, tied into you know, American um, migration and how we settled our country and where that technology went um, is readable according to ethnic patterns and so forth. It's really quite a science I would encourage you to look into the guild as a as a source for continued controversy on that subject. <laughs> Aaron, Thank would you, you say Aaron. it paralleled the sawmill industry a little bit too? To a degree, yes. But but John, the sawmills came in awfully early. They just weren't equipped to do the bigger timbers. Um, but certainly there was a loss of the skill set that came with scribe rule timber framing. The timbers were more uniform throughout the sawmill. Which, still, which allowed you know, some of that square rule technology to be pretty easy to do. So I think it was evolving at the same time or parallel, but I'm not sure it, it spurred that. I think, I think the technology for sawing has been there since we first settled really. As soon as we could get the water powered mill up, we saw sawmills, um, but certainly it had an impact on productivity and so forth along with square rule framing. Okay, let's um, continue the discussion after I do my closing comments because I know okay. there's there's some additional questions and discussion we'd like Great. to. Um, so anyway, I want to thank John and Aaron for this really informative presentation. Um, so much great information and for both of them for all the work they do to help preserve New Hampshire's historic structures and especially barns. Um, they're both very involved and big promoters of barn preservation throughout the state. So thank you very much. And we applaud your interest and dedication to this work. Um, we love get, getting like-minded folks like you together to share information, connect and offer doses of energy and inspiration to thoughtful experience presenters like John and Aaron and your great questions and involvement make a huge impact on advancing preservation interest and efforts across New Hampshire. Uh, we want you to know the Alliance is here to help and encourage you. Um, we welcome you to visit our website, nhpreservation.org, or send me an email at bt at nhpreservation.org at any time. I'm happy to answer any barn question, any type of preservation questions, and actually um, help get you to a contractor or the appropriate information you're looking for. Um, our next expo session will be on Thursday at noon with Laura Black from the New Hampshire Division of Historical Resources presenting an overview of New Hampshire architecture. Um, visit our website, nhpreservation.org for a complete list of our expo schedule and to register for upcoming programs. Um, we encourage you to share our expo website link with other old house and barn enthusiasts and be sure to check out our expo guide of 50 products and service providers on the expo page of the website as well. And for those of you who've been to our in-person expo in the past, you know how we love to give away door prizes at our event as a token of your appreciation for your participation. So I'll turn it over to my colleague, Nicole Flynn, to announce the lucky winner of John's book, Preserving Old Barns. It's a wonderful resource offering practical and understanding of the history, function, and preservation of old barns. It's a must have for any barn owner. And there it is, John's holding it up. <laughs>
So Nicole, I'll turn it over to you to announce our winner. Our winner for this evening is Karen Coons. Yay, Karen. Karen, are you on? I don't know if she's on. No, Karen? She's here. Oh, she is here. I'm here. Okay, good. Very good. Thank you very much. Very You're very good. welcome. Karen, do you have a barn? Uh, no, actually, I'm a member of the, uh, um, on the board of the New York State Barn Coalition. Wow. So Excellent. It's just, it's just an interest of mine, put it that way. Great. So spread John and Aaron's book around in New York. Yeah, I really appreciated having, you know, being able to have access to these um, um, webcasts because it's very important. Oh, you're breaking up a little bit. Well, anyway, congratulations. Oh, no, just, and thanks for joining thank us you. tonight. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. And I. I want to mention also that I'll be sending this follow up email out, I think tomorrow, um, with additional links for barn resources. I know we talked about a lot of um, mills and other resources, and I can put some of that in the email to help folks. Um, we'll also have a short survey in there that I'd ask you to please fill out to help us with uh, future programming. And please keep the preservation. Um, in mind and vibrant by making a donation or considering a gift membership. And thanks again to John and Aaron for their informative presentation and to our Old House and Barn Expo sponsors. John, can you flip the slide to show our sponsors um, for making these programs possible and to all of you who are supporters of our critical work that helps to advance our efforts to save and steward special places around New Hampshire. We wish you well and look forward to seeing you at future Alliance programs. So thank you all for joining. And for those who would like to stay on for a few more minutes of discussion, please feel free to do so. Very good. Okay. So John, we can probably stop the sharing and then just stop sharing your screen. <laughs> Okay, so let me see if we have any, I have, um, relating to something I think Aaron just said, Aaron, can you touch on um, principal rafters versus common rafters sure. and what part of the state we might find those and what they mean? Yeah, yeah. Thank um, you. Yeah, roof systems are of many kinds, but the two principal types that we see in New Hampshire um, our principal rafter purlin roofs, which are principal large timber frames, like I showed in the English barn, with horizontal smaller purlins that connect those principal rafters together. That's a very early roof framing system, and we see that both in scribe rule and square rule barns, depending on where they are built and so forth. The other type of rafter roof system is the common rafter roof which can sometimes be a whole series of large principal rafters side by each along the length of the building, or it can be smaller dimensional rafters, more like a three by seven or a three by eight type of common rafter, typically 24 inches on center. Um, so it's a very different look when you go inside the barn, but it still produces a similar result in the sense that it creates a nice long lasting heavy roof system that you can put a nice metal roof on. Um, those are the two types of roofs. You'll see some variation on a theme there, but typically it's going to be one of those two uh, certain types. The biggest difference is the purlins going horizontally between fewer rafters versus multiple rafters closer together. And they're in two all, on a major rafter, the boards go up and down too, usually. Well, because of the purlins being horizontal, the rafter, the rafter covering, the sheathing is vertical. On a common rafter roof, John, you're absolutely right. Those boards would have to go horizontally across the roof to um, nail into each and every rafter. And the horizontal boarding stiffens the roof plane considerably. Um, and that makes a very strong roof. So it's kind of making a, a membrane of sheathing 
nailed individually into every rafter and there are more rafters than there are purlins in that roof. So it's a pretty solid, stiff roof system. And remember I mentioned, you'll see sometimes in early barns, they have a dip. Well, that's a dip in the principal rafter over its length, but it's also a dip in the purlin between the rafters. So in a common rafter roof, you don't see that dipping quite as much. Sometimes both roof systems will have a collar tie, which is a beam that's horizontal between the rafters. Um, and you see that in common rafter roofs and you see that in principal rafters. In a lot of barns, those are cut out certainly late 19th century for the hay track. So we see roofs get into trouble with that, but it's common to have a, have a uh, collar tie in both roof systems as well. Yep. yep. How about a ridge pole, Aaron? Ridge poles, that is all, not a part generally of the earlier scribe rule frames. Typically the principal rafters simply um, join together with no ridge, but sometimes they would have a ridge purlin, which is not a ridge board. It's just simply the, the last purlin. In a common rafter roof in the earlier types, you don't have a ridge board either. They simply nail to each other or come to a plumb cut at the top. Um, but also later on, we'll see a ridge board. There is called, there is also a form of framing which has a ridge beam or a five-sided ridge, which is literally a heavy timber frame ridge that the rafters engage at the peak. Um, we do see that in New England a fair amount. That can go with a purlin roof. It can go with a common rafter roof. Typically, we see those ridge beams when they combine a principal rafter principal purlin common rafter roof, which includes all of that system into the strongest roof frame there is that combines heavy timber frame and light framing on the larger barns to span greater distances. So that's where we see the ridge beam come in typically and a, rid, and a, and a principal purlin, which is about halfway down the roof plane, heavy timber that common rafters come into. Um, We've also seen barns that just have common rafters, you know, 24 feet long that are three by sixes and they bend a lot. So it, it's really, you know, walk into your own barn and see what you've got. But those are the typical styles that you see. And sometimes they are wonderfully combined into very strong roof systems, especially on the larger barns where they're getting ambitious with spans and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and I don't want to end today's program without talking about the danger of fire in a barn, especially since one of your um, example barns, Aaron, had that issue. Yeah, well, I mean, it's certainly true that fire can take a barn out awfully quick. Um, I mean, you don't want to leave anything in there that's flammable. Um, there are they are timber frames, so you'll get out. But it's not always, you know, the barn doesn't always survive that. Timber frames, however, are extraordinarily resistant to failure because of their size. So when they burn, um, sometimes they can be repaired afterwards. It really depends on how quick you get to it. But they are made of wood and they will burn. So um, in some of the adaptive reuses that we do, we will have sprinkler systems in a barn. Um, it's not unheard of, typically not for an agricultural purpose, but for almost any other purpose, whether it's residential or, you know, theater or wedding venue, you might consider fire suppression in a barn. And they can, they go in very easily because they're just simply exposed within the frame. And I encourage that a lot for any adaptive reuse because, you know, more people are in the barn. You have, you have uh, public safety issues that you want to deal with. And uh, the sprinkler systems are by far the most efficient way to, to uh, secure a barn from fire, for sure. Okay, and I have to say this because this is how our barn burned down before we even bought our house, but extension cords. Don't use extension cords in barns, please. Yeah, no, I mean, separate, separate panels for your barn are absolutely essential if you're doing any kind of renovation you know, put, a, put, a, put your own feed for the barn into the barn with its own panel and make sure the electrical work is up to, up to snuff, no doubt. Yep. Okay, thank you. So I think that is it. Does anybody have any additional questions they'd like to ask before we do our wrap up? <laughs> 
I don't think so. All right, so just once again, thank you so much, John and Aaron, this was great. Um, and if you, any of the participants out there have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, I'll put contact information in the follow-up email so you can um, get in touch with Aaron or John as well. John, Very Aaron, good. do you have anything to add? Oh, and I think Beverly, they can uh, get the book through your website. Oh, too. they can get, yep, John's book through our website. And I also wanted to mention, John does have his Humanities to Go schedule and I will include that. Uh, actually, no, all John's programs are on our event calendar. So you can see um, when those are as well. Very good. Okay, so thank you all so much and keep up the good work preserving New Hampshire's historic barns. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Have a great <laughs> evening, everyone. Bye-bye.